Hey there, welcome to FISM News. I'm Samuel Case, and tonight, President Biden rallies with Kamala Harris for the first time. Donald Trump goes on the offensive on the economy, and Democrats are caught changing news headlines on Google. All right, and filling in for Renata Kish for the uh, last time as she's coming back from uh, vacation next week is FISM's Ian Patrick. Welcome, Ian. Thank you so much, Sam. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was just about to say I believe this is my last time, at least for this couple of weeks span that I've been hosting the show with you, and it's been a blast. It's been a lot of fun. But let's get to today's news. That is President Joe Biden made his first joint appearance with Vice President Kamala Harris since ending his reelect campaign last month, as last night both Biden and Harris appeared together on stage during an event in Prince George's County, Maryland. That's just outside of Washington, D.C. There, Biden gave a ringing endorsement of Harris's bid for the White House. Folks, I have an incredible partner progress we've made, she's going to make one hell of a president. During the event, Harris introduced Biden, calling him a, quote, extraordinary president. Much of the event focused on the Biden administration's latest efforts to lower prescription drug costs, and FISM's Ian Patrick has those details. That's right, Sam. During their joint rally on Thursday, Vice President Harris also announced a landmark agreement regarding drug pricing under Medicare. Here's what that is. Two years ago, we gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prescription drug prices for the first time in history. Medicare has collective bargaining power. And now Medicare can use that power to go toe to toe with Big Pharma and negotiate lower drug prices. The Biden administration expounded on this yesterday by saying that prices on 10 of the costliest drugs under Medicare have now officially been lowered. These drugs are used to treat diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and heart failure, among some other conditions, ailments, and diseases. In most cases, these drugs were lowered hundreds of dollars from their previous listing, and that's for a 30-day supply specifically. In a couple of other cases, such as Imbruvica, which treats blood cancers, the price was actually lowered by more than $5,000. Now, although this is a nice sounding move, some are warning that it might come at another cost. Advisor to former President Trump, Joe Grogan, for example, says that the lost revenue will be made up by dramatically increasing premiums for Medicare. Meanwhile, Harris is laying out the details for her economic agenda today after announcing plans to introduce price controls to ease the pain of inflation. The Harris campaign calls it the first ever federal ban on price gouging on food and groceries, setting clear rules of the road to make clear that big corporations can't unfairly exploit consumers to run up excessive corporate profits on food and groceries. The plan expands on ongoing efforts by the Biden administration to blame inflation on corporate greed, but economists are rather wary of the move as former investment banker Carol Roth told The Daily Wire that the policy could have devastating effects on the food industry. The food service industry, particularly grocery stores, they operate on a 1% to 3% profit margin. And somehow she's blaming them for inflation, which is silly. So the idea that she's going to somehow institute some type of price caps, you know, that would be a price control. And if anybody has studied history or economics, you know that a price control leads to rationing. It is something that is done in socialist types of societies, it always has a bad outcome. Writing in the Washington Post, economics columnist Catherine Rample said, quote, it's hard to exaggerate just how bad this policy is, saying it could lead to shortages, black markets, and hoarding, among other things. But it does have some advocates, as Democrat Senator Elizabeth Warren posted on X, quote, a handful of big corporations control the food industry and they're keeping prices high because they know they can. She said Democrats are calling them out, that would be these big food companies, and and forcing them to bring down costs. Meanwhile, former President Trump is ramping up his attacks against Vice President Harris. In his second press conference this week, Trump unleashed a barrage of complaints against the vice president, saying he is entitled to such attacks. I'm very angry at her that she'd weaponized the justice system against me and other people. Very angry at her. 
Uh, I think I'm entitled to personal attacks. I don't have a lot of respect for her. I don't have a lot of respect for her intelligence. And I think she'll be a terrible president. And I think it's very important that we win. Speaking from his New Jersey golf club, Trump criticized Harris on multiple points, including immigration, which has been a very special topic as of late, but took special time to actually degrade her economic policies. Standing beside an assortment of items you can find at almost any grocery store, Trump aimed at the proposed price caps, which Sam had mentioned, calling it communist price controls. Now Kamala is reportedly proposing communist price controls. She wants price controls. And if they worked, I'd go along with it, too. But they don't work. They actually have the exact opposite impact and effect. But it leads to food shortages, rationing hunger, dramatically more inflation, like something straight out of Venezuela or the Soviet Union. This announcement is an admission that her economic policies have totally failed and caused really a catastrophe for our country. And beyond that, a catastrophe in the world. Now, all this comes as uh, he bashes Harris for avoiding the press at large by not having done any interviews or conferences since she became the Democrat nominee. That's right. And actually, it's not just Trump and Republicans criticizing the Harris campaign for ducking interviews, as now even some members of the media are starting to, dig, to get just a bit frustrated about the whole situation. CNN's Jim Acosta, for example, who, by the way, is a noted Trump critic, he called out a Harris spokesman this week for refusing to hold a press conference. Would it kill you guys to have a press conference? Why hasn't she had a press conference? <laughs> Listen, the vice president and Governor Walz uh, have been busy crisscrossing this country since uh, the launch of this campaign. And I mean, you know, a campaign rally is not a press conference. Why hasn't she had a press conference? She's the vice president. She can handle the questions. Why not do it? Oh, we absolutely are going to do it. You hear her take questions as she's out on the stump. And she's, as she said last week, uh, we're going to be having a sit down interview here before the end of the month. I don't I don't want to, you know, belabor this, but one interview before the end of the month. I mean, that's that's not a lot. As Ian mentioned, to date, Harris has not given a single interview or press conference since launching her campaign. This week, in lieu of an actual interview, uh, Harris chose instead to sit down for a pre-recorded conversation with her running mate, Tim Walz. It is an amazing privilege for me also. Uh, I'm excited. I just want to be part of the excitement that you're generating. Well, we're so. doing it together, buddy. We're doing it together. How have these last couple of days been for you? I can see where the, the energy comes. America is a hopeful country. Indeed. People are excited. Harris supporters praised that video, unsurprisingly, but it was widely panned by conservatives, many of them calling it scripted and fake, especially mocking the more lighthearted moments. Like I have white guy tacos and what like that black. Like mayonnaise and tuna? What are you doing? Pretty much ground beef and cheese. That's and okay. Like, Do yeah. you put any flavor in it? Uh, no. Oh. Um, here's the deal. <laughs> no, they said to be careful and let her know this, that black pepper is the top of the spice level in Minnesota, you know? I'm the first vice president, I believe, who has ever grown chili peppers. I'm trying you know, to expand my, we'll uh, my food knowledge. I truly don't know what to do with that last statement from <laughs> Vice President Harris there. But all the while, there is still persistent conversation over when, where, and how future debates will be held. For example, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz and Senator J.D. Vance have agreed to a debate on October 1st, which will be hosted by CBS. And if that seems somewhat late for their first time debating, it's because there was a chance for an earlier matchup between the two, which ended up falling through. Vance accepted another debate on September 18th, run by CNN. But yesterday, the harris Walls campaign released a statement which effectively shut down that and other campaign or debate possibilities, excuse me. That campaign statement reads, quote, the debate about debates is over. Donald Trump's campaign accepted our proposal for three debates, two of them presidential and a vice presidential debate. Now, the first presidential debate between Trump and Harris is currently scheduled for September 10th, and that's going to be hosted by ABC. But Trump has actually floated a separate debate held by Fox News on September 4th, alleging that ABC would be too biased. And it is currently unknown if Trump plans to appear at the ABC debate at this time, although he has indicated that he will not do so. And coming up next, Gaza ceasefire talks continue in the Middle East. We'll be, back, we'll be back with that and more international news after this. Are you new to biblically responsible investing? 
As Christians, we have the responsibility to be good stewards of the money God has entrusted us with. As we invest in the market, we want to make sure that the companies we invest in aren't taking money and using it to fund industries that grieve the heart of God, like pornography, abortion, gambling, or the LGBT agenda. That doesn't mean a company must be a Christian company to be biblically responsible. It means that company is solely focused on excellence in its industry and doesn't support things that God hates. To learn more about biblically responsible investing and how you can put it to practice in your portfolio, go to financialissues.org. The mission of Financial Issues is to expose Jesus for all He is, all He means, and all that He can do. On the day I found I was pregnant, I was full of emotions and I just was so overwhelmed and I don't know if I'm ready for this huge life altering, changing commitment. I had individuals around me not wanting me to have this child. And somehow, and I was driving and I saw the Women's Help Center sign and I immediately turned in. That just took relief off of me. And I was like, you know what? It's gonna be okay. They gave me the confidence and the support that I needed to be able to go out and face the world. First time I held Finnegan, I just lit up with joy. I was so excited. This little boy that I had in my life, he is loving and generous. Watching him just grow and flourish into this incredible human being has just been so rewarding and so uplifting. Looking back, I don't know what I would do without him because I needed him more than I think he needed me. And welcome back once again to FISM News. I'm Ian Patrick. Let's start here with some updates on the ceasefire negotiations in Gaza, where talks between Israel and Hamas entered their second day today. The ongoing negotiations in Qatar are attempting to prevent the conflict from growing into something that engulfs the entire Middle East. Although Hamas officials are not directly attending these talks, they are being represented by mediators from both Qatar and Egypt. Negotiations have proposed a three-phase plan so far, which involves Hamas releasing most of the hostages they kidnapped from Israel in exchange for a permanent ceasefire, the withdrawal of Israeli soldiers from Gaza, and an Israeli release of Palestinian prisoners. At the moment, Iranian-backed terrorist group Hezbollah has also promised to delay any attacks on Israel during these negotiations, as the group reportedly does not want to disrupt any possible peace deal. And turning our attention for a moment to the uh, war in Ukraine, where the Ukrainian military is now reporting the capture of its largest town since invading Russia. In the words of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, the city of Sudza was successfully liberated from Russian forces. It has a pre-war population of around 5,000 people and is roughly six miles from the Ukrainian border. Zelensky says it will house a new military command office as well, hinting at a long-term occupation of Russia's Kursk region. Ukrainian and special forces also claim to have captured over 100 Russian soldiers in the region as of Wednesday. U.S. National Security spokesman John Kirby reports that Russian units are now being redirected from the front lines in Ukraine back to their homeland. However, he did not confirm how many are being sent back. And while we're in Russia, a U.S. Russian ballerina who apparently donated to a Ukrainian charity is now sentenced to 12 years in a Russian penal colony. That ballerina is Ksenia Karolina, and she was convicted of high treason. Authorities say that she assisted Ukraine in purchasing tactical medical supplies and weapons. But according to a former employer, Karolina gave around $50 to a Ukrainian charity in the U.S., that donation was made all the way back in 2022 at the onset of the war. The L.A.-based ballerina was visiting her elderly grandmother in Russia when investigators searched her phone. Karolina's attorney says that they will appeal the sentencing while working towards a prisoner swap. Meanwhile, the U.S. State Department stated that it is not a crime to give to charities, especially on U.S. soil. Donating to a nonprofit organization, uh, donating to an NGO, uh, supporting uh, the Ukrainian cause and supporting the Ukrainian people as they uh, defend themselves against uh, Russian aggression, um, especially doing so on American soil, is uh, not a crime. 
And a new report from the UN revealed this week that over a million school-aged girls in Afghanistan have been denied at least some form of education since 2021. According to that report, which was released yesterday, over 1.4 million girls have been denied access to secondary education since the Taliban took over the country nearly three years ago. The report, released by the UN cultural agency UNESCO, read in part, quote, in just three years, they de facto authorities have almost wiped out two decades of steady progress for education in Afghanistan and the future of an entire generation is now in jeopardy. That report also blamed Taliban authorities for depriving boys of education by banning female teachers from teaching male students. And let's move now to South America where U.S. President Joe Biden supports a new election in Venezuela which is currently in a political crisis after its most recent disputed election. Longtime Venezuelan leader Nicolas Maduro has refused to release the voting tallies, but rejects any claims that the opposition won by a landslide. The U.S. president told reporters yesterday that he backs a suggestion from the Brazilian president to have international observers present, present at a second election. Maduro quickly fired back, saying he rejected the U.S. as an electoral authority. The Venezuelan president has rebuffed suggestions for a peaceful solution to the ever-growing crisis. And amidst all that, there's growing international consensus that he has indeed stolen this election. This all also happens to come as he continues to crack down on any opposition. As of right now, around 1,300 people have been jailed and 24 killed since July 28th, which was the date of the election. Mm -hmm. Pretty tense situation down in Venezuela. We'll continue to follow that here on FISM News. Uh, before we go to a break here, the first case of a dangerous new strain of NPOX, formerly known as monkeypox, was now confirmed outside of Africa as of this week. It's called NPOX Clade 1. That's the name of this new strain. The Swedish Public Health Agency just confirmed a case of the disease, saying the person came, uh, became infected while down in Africa. Mpox has passed through close contact and is known for its flu-like symptoms along with nasty skin lesions. Experts identified the more severe and frankly deadlier strain last fall as it caused 450 deaths in the Congo during its initial outbreak. Sweden's confirmation comes on the same exact day that the World Health Organization labeled the virus as an international concern. The WHO has since urged countries to act transparently and quickly against against the virus, warning Europe that it will see more imported cases in the coming weeks. All right, and we have plenty more news coming up next, but first, let's go back in time with Seth Udinsky for a moment in history. Welcome back to A Moment in History. I'm Seth Udinsky. In this moment in history, let's turn our attention to our first parents, Adam and Eve, and perhaps the most horrific moment in the history of the world. Now, after Adam and Eve were placed by God in the Garden of Eden, they lived in perfect harmony with God and with each other. In Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, everything went right, but in Genesis chapter 3, everything went wrong. Let's explore today perhaps the worst moment in the history of the world, the fall of man. Now, in Genesis 3, sometime after the creation of the world several thousand years ago, we are introduced to a new character in the created world. We meet the serpent, and this is not just a random talking snake. This is Satan, the devil, our mortal enemy and the hater of God and his people. We rightly assume that at this point in history, Satan has already rebelled against God and God has cast him down from heaven. So Satan tempted Eve, telling her that she should do what God had commanded her not to do, which was eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. God had given Adam and Eve total freedom with one simple command. You can eat from the fruit of any tree in the garden except this one. Satan tempted Eve ultimately with the ultimate temptation behind all sin, self-idolatry. He says, if you do this, you will be like God. In other words, you get to be God. You get to be in charge. So Eve listened to the serpent and ate the fruit. Now here we get to a shocking point in the story. Genesis 3 tells us that Adam was there with Eve the whole time. He should have stepped between his wife and the serpent, but he just sat there and watched. And when Eve invited him to sin with her, he joined her and disobeyed God. And so humanity fell. Because we sinned, the perfect relationship we had with God was broken. 
all evil and calamity in the world today is a result of our sin. Because of sin, there is sadness and hatred and violence and racism and abortion and perversion and scandal and death. Sin brings separation from God. This is obviously something about which we should be ashamed because truthfully, if it was any one of us, we would have done the same thing. But I want you to see and remember that even in this horrible moment in history, God's grace is still on display. He clothes Adam and Eve in their nakedness, and then he punishes Adam, Eve, and the serpent. But look at what happens here. To Adam, he promised that his work would be toilsome and hard. And for thousands of years since, men have toiled in their work for little reward. He also promised death that we would return to dust, and every human since Adam has died. To Eve, he promised pain in childbirth, and women for centuries have felt the pain of childbirth since. But to the serpent, he promised the most awful curse and simultaneously our greatest hope. God promised that an offspring of Eve would someday come and crush the serpent's head. And friends, Jesus is that offspring. He crushed the serpent's head when he died on the cross and rose again, undoing what Adam did and bringing his people back into right relationship with him. And that is good news indeed. Thanks so much for joining me once again for a moment in history. Through the ministry of Preborn, the Financial Issues family has saved tens of thousands of lives of babies. What an amazing job that God has done through you, the Financial Issues family. Would you join us in saving the lives of babies? What an amazing reunion we will have in glory, meeting all the people that we have saved. Please go to preborn.org, that is preborn.org, or financialissues.org and click on the Preborn banner. There are moments in life that define us. Choices determine the courses we take. Choices that create life or those that save a life. And some make life worthwhile. There are decisions to stay or to go, to remain the same or to grow. Sometimes we pray and make peace. Other times we take a stand for what we believe. In celebration, mourning, triumph, and defeat, we are invested in every decision we seek. Despite differences, we have one thing in common, the desire to do all for the glory of God. Keep your wallet aligned with your heart and your investments in harmony with your faith. Timothy Plan, biblically responsible mutual funds, ETFs, and retirement plans. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at timothyplan.com. Read carefully before investing. All right, and welcome back to FISM News. I'm Samuel Case. We begin with a rather odd crime story where a Jordanian national has now been charged with destroying an energy facility down in Florida and threatening to use an explosive on four separate occasions. AG Merrick Garland announced those charges this week, saying the suspect intended to, quote, carry out mass violence in the U.S., He's accused of causing $700,000 in damages to a Florida solar panel facility for its perceived support of Israel. In fact, the incident is an escalation in an anti-Israel destruction spree that saw business doors smashed with threatening letters left behind. They were addressed to U.S. government officials and threatened to, quote, destroy or explode America. The man was arrested in early July and faces 10 years in federal prison per threat and up to 20 years for destroying the facility if he's convicted. Certainly a crazy story indeed, but let's shift back to some politics here. We're on Wednesday. Officials in Congress announced that they will be investigating why big tech companies, Google and Meta, reportedly censored information about the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer reportedly sent letters to Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg and Google CEO Sundar Pichai seeking documents on their internal processes. The committee is reportedly looking for materials related to how the companies handled user research of the assassination attempt. The letters came after Google's search engine failed to autocomplete the Trump assassination attempt and reportedly de-emphasized results that discussed the attempted assassination. Meta was also accused of censorship after their artificial intelligence bot described the assassination attempt as fictional, and some posts featuring iconic images from that event were taken during the assassination, 
were blocked by Facebook. The, the letters sent to the tech CEOs claimed that the committee was trying to determine if these results were, quote, technical error, a policy intended to ensure safety, or a specific intent to mislead. And keeping with news in big tech, where there could be a bit of a scandal brewing for Kamala Harris as her campaign, alongside other Democratic candidates, were exposed this week to be manipulating news content on Google search ads to their benefit. Both Axios and the Washington Examiner reported that campaigns have been using their ad dollars to promote real news articles with edited headlines and previews. Just for example, one of these ads reads, quote, VP Harris's economic vision, lower costs and higher wages. The ad then links to an AP article, making it appear as if this news outlet is reporting a rather positive headline for Kamala Harris. Similar ads have been seen alongside other uh, outlets such as The Guardian, Reuters, CBS News and more. Many of them had no idea this was going on. Google has since responded, saying that the ads don't violate their rules since they are labeled as sponsored, though it did say a glitch did make it so not all the proper information was displayed in some of these cases. Google also says that other campaigns have used this tactic before. You know, it's really interesting that other campaigns have used that tactic, but at least from my end of things, it feels like that sort of tactic wouldn't play very well with the American populace in general, Sam. I don't know if you'd agree with that. No, I would think so. It would look like that you're trying to manipulate them in some way. It, it's true. They, Google didn't go into saying who has or hasn't done this, besides specifically saying that the Trump campaign has not been engaging in this behavior, at least for this election cycle. All right. Well, that's very interesting indeed, and we'll keep an eye on that coverage. But finally, let's go to a group supporting Kamala Harris for president, which has earned the ire of a rather surprising figure, that of Reverend Franklin Graham. The issue stems from an advertisement put out by the group Evangelicals for Harris, which uses a clip of Franklin's late father, the great Reverend Billy Graham, as an attack ad against Republican candidate Donald Trump. Have you been to the cross and said, Lord, I have sinned, I'm sorry for my sin, I'm willing to change my way of life. Have you ever asked God for forgiveness? That's a tough question. I'm not sure I have, I just, I don't bring God into that picture, I don't. Franklin Graham responded to the ad on X saying that the group and liberal media as a whole is trying to mislead people by using his father's image. Graham says that Billy, quote, appreciated the conservative values and policies of President Donald Trump in 2016 and says that his views would likely have not changed. Evangelicals for Harris responded to that, accusing Franklin of forsaking the gospel in exchange of worshiping Trump. Fascinating stuff there. With that, that is our program for today. So thank you so much for joining us. And please visit our website. It's FISMnews.tv for more content over the weekend. You can also follow us on social media as well, at FISM News on all the major platforms, or download the FISM app to take us on the go. Thanks so much, and God bless. And we'll see you on Monday with more news coverage.